Hey everyone, Mr. Brown here. It's officially springtime here at the fort and Squeaks, Jesse, and I have had a great time getting our hands dirty in the garden. We've planted all kinds of new seeds and are excited to see how they grow. All that gardening has also got me thinking about how amazing plants are. They come in so many shapes and sizes and they're all so interesting. Oh. That's a great idea, Squeaks. Squeaks pointed out that we've talked about plants tons of times on SciShow Kids. So why don't we watch some of those episodes together? Which one should we start with, Squeaks? Oh, that's a great call. Since we just planted a bunch of seeds, Squeaks suggested watching our episode about how a seed becomes a big grown-up plant. Let's check it out. Oh, hey guys, Squeaks and I are checking out our plants and they look great. It's almost hard to believe that these beautiful flowers and plants came from the teeny tiny seeds we put in the pots just a few weeks ago. You might be familiar with the little packets of seeds that you use to grow flowers or vegetables in your garden, or maybe the sunflower seeds that you find in your snack mix. But did you know that popcorn kernels, beans, peas, acorns, and rice are also seeds? Well, one of our friends, five-year-old Dimitri, wrote in to ask us, how does a seed grow into a plant? Thanks for asking, Dimitri. First of all, seeds come in lots of different shapes and sizes, but they're all made of three parts. An outer shell called the seed coat, a tiny baby plant that's inside the seed called the embryo, and some plant food for the embryo called endosperm. The seed coat has an important job. It covers the entire seed, protecting the little baby plant inside and keeping it from drying out. The seed coat also has super sensing powers. It has special chemicals in it that can tell when the seed is in the right place to start growing. For example, the sunflower seeds and the pumpkin seeds in your trail mix sense that it's not safe to grow. After all, seeds can't grow when they're surrounded by raisins and chocolate chips. So while the seeds are in a bag or in your hands, it's like they're asleep. The seeds are still alive, but they're dormant or inactive. Some seeds can stay like this for hundreds or even thousands of years. Great question, Squeaks. To get started, every seed needs water, the right temperature, and the right amount of light. Once the seed has these three things, like when it's planted in some nice wet soil, the embryo, or baby plant, gets the signal to start growing. For plants, this growing process is called germination. First, the seed coat lets some water through to the embryo, but the embryo needs more than just water if it's going to grow. Good thing there's a whole bunch of plant food right there inside the seed. Until the plant can make its own food from sunlight, which it will need leaves to do, it relies on the endosperm for energy. It's like the little baby plant has its own backpack of snacks. So the embryo keeps growing and taking in more water until the seed coat cracks open and the embryo kicks out a kind of a foot. But not at all like my foot. The first part of the plant to come out of the seed is the root. The root always grows downward, no matter what way the seed is planted. A seed can actually tell which way is up and which way is down. So the root pushes down deeper and deeper into the soil, looking for more water and minerals to feed the baby plant. Once the plant is all grown up, those deep roots will have another job. They'll help keep the plant from falling over or blowing away in the wind. But soon after the first baby root finds its way into the dirt, another part of the seed pops out, this time in the opposite direction. A shoot, which has the stem of the plant and a few leaves pushes its way up towards the sunlight. Once the shoot breaks through the soil to the open air above, we say that it's sprouted. Now the plant doesn't need the endosperm anymore because it can make its own food from sunlight. With enough water and sunlight and the right temperature, the young plant will continue to grow, getting bigger and growing more leaves until it's an adult plant and it can produce seeds of its own. Next time you're about to chow down on a handful of sunflower seeds, just think, it's like you've got a whole field of flowers right in your hand. Wow, I can't wait until our seeds grow up like that. I bet we'll get tons of nice green leaves and plenty of flowers too. That's right. We've also talked about flowers here at the fort too and what's inside them. Let's watch that one next. Squeaks just gave me the nicest Valentine's Day surprise ever, a bouquet of flowers. Flowers are fun to look at and they usually smell great, but they actually have a really important job. They use their pretty colors and smells to attract animals, which help make new plants. If you've seen our episode about fruit, you might remember that some animals like bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, and even bats move powdery stuff called pollen from one flower to another. These animals are called pollinators, and the pollen they carry helps flowers make the seeds that can grow into new plants. So that's a flower's job, to use its nice colors and smells 
to attract pollinators. Each part of the plant, from the long green stem to the beautiful petals, helps the flower do that job. And you can see how each part of the plant works if you look at it up close. Botanists, the scientists who study plants, will sometimes learn more about a plant by cutting it open and looking at the pieces. Squeaks, would it be okay if we took a closer look at one of these flowers? Great, you can try this at home too. All you need is a flower, a knife, and help from a grown-up since you'll need to cut some things. The flower we're going to use is called a lily, but most other kinds of flowers will work too. The first thing you should do is separate all the main parts of the flower. Cut the flower off of the stem, then take off the leaves. Now that all the big parts are separated, you can take a closer look at each of them. The stem is really strong and stiff. That's because it needs to support the rest of the plant. The stem also connects to the roots of the plant. The roots suck up water and nutrients from the ground, and the stem brings it to the leaves of the flower. This flower's roots were already trimmed off, which is why you can't see them. Another one of the stem's jobs is to bring food from the leaves to the flower. So let's look at the leaves next. Leaves grow out of the stem, and they're full of green stuff called chlorophyll. When the sun shines on the leaves, the chlorophyll turns sunlight into food for the plants. See those little lines running through the leaf? Those are veins, and they're a lot like the veins that move blood through your body. The veins in the leaf bring water and nutrients in from the stem, and they carry the food the chlorophyll made to the rest of the plant. So the stem and the leaves collect and carry water, food, and other nutrients that help the flowers grow and stay healthy. So now let's look at the flower. Flowers make a sugary liquid called nectar that pollinators love to eat. So to a pollinator, the flower's color and smell are like a big sign that says, there's lots of food here, come eat. If you pull the petals off the flower, you can see that there are these sort of long dangly things left inside. They're called the stamen, and they make the pollen. When a pollinator finds a flower, it comes to eat nectar, and while it's eating, pollen from the stamen gets stuck to the animal. Then, when it flies off to get nectar from another flower, it spreads the pollen to that other flower, and that's pollination. Now, there's just one part left this sort of big stick thing called the pistil. That's the part of the flower that collects the pollen that pollinators bring from other flowers. It's kind of sticky on the end, so the pollen sticks to it. If pollen from another flower makes its way into the pistil, the pistil can use the pollen to make seeds. And then those seeds can eventually become new plants. So the next time you're outside, take a look at all the flowers around you. There are thousands of different kinds, but they all do basically the same job. Amazing. That was so cool. When some of our flowers grow, we'll have to look and see if we can identify all those different flower parts too. Now, speaking of plants, there's one kind of plant we haven't talked about so far, and I think it's one of the coolest meat-eating plants. Squeaks, could we watch that one next? Awesome. Let's do it. We all know that we have to eat different kinds of food to get the nutrition that we need, so eating plants is a great idea if you want to be healthy. That's why I like to eat things like carrots and spinach and tomatoes. I like to eat plants, but what if plants tried to eat animals? Well, there are actually a few kinds of plants that are carnivorous, meaning they eat meat. Now, when I say meat, I'm not talking about chicken nuggets or hamburgers. I'm talking about really small animals like insects, spiders, and frogs. Creatures like these have to be extra careful around meat-eating plants. Probably the most famous carnivorous plant is known as the Venus flytrap. Venus flytraps have leaves at the tops of their stems that kind of look like tiny toothy mouths. They're not really mouths, but they serve the same purpose, to eat flies and other insects. Usually, the trap's leaves are wide open, and the inside of the trap smells like food to insects, so they fly or crawl right into it looking for a meal. But if they aren't careful, they become the meal instead. On each half of the trap, there are three three tiny hairs. If an insect touches two of those hairs, the trap shuts and the slender spines around the edges of the leaves close together tightly, trapping the insect inside. Then the trap slowly digests its meal, meaning it breaks its food down into smaller pieces. It's too bad for that little insect, but it will provide energy for that plant to live. And Venus flytraps aren't the only kind of carnivorous plant. Some plants, called sundews, attract bugs with colorful red and green leaves that are covered with a sweet, sticky dew that sparkles in the sunlight. The thing is, is this dew acts like a kind of glue. Any bug that lands on its leaves looking for a meal will get stuck. 
And soon the plant just starts digesting it, soaking up nutrients from the bug's body right through the leaves. Now some other carnivorous plants can consume even bigger prey. Pitcher plants, for example, have big, brightly colored leaves curled up into a shape of a tube. At the bottom of the tube sits a little pool of sweet liquid called nectar. Once again, lots of different creatures are drawn to its tasty smell. They creep, crawl, jump or fly to the edge of the tube to see what's in there to eat. But the top is really slippery, and there are stiff hairs all along the inside of the tube pointing down. So once the creature starts to fall in, they can't get out. This clever kind of trap has allowed pitcher plants to catch not just bugs, but also make meals of small frogs and even mice. And finally, there are some meat-eating plants that don't even live on land. Bladder warts, for example, live and catch their prey in water. These plants have tiny containers on their stems called bladders that float underwater. Each bladder has an opening with a tiny flap on it that can open and close like a hidden trap door. When insects, like water fleas, trigger tiny hairs near the trap door, the door swings open and sucks the little creature in. So now you know, certain plants sometimes eat animals. Like I said, it's nice to have variety in your diet. I love carnivorous plants. There are so many different kinds of plants out there, and some of them are really surprising. Oh, good memory. Speaking of surprising plants, Squeaks remembers that one day, he and Jesse learned about the stinkiest flower in the world. Squeaks, do you remember why it was so smelly? No worries. Let's watch the episode together, and we can learn more. Oh, hey guys, we're just watering these pretty flowers that Squeaks picked out. Tulips are my favorite flowers because they're just so pretty, but I like lilacs because I love the way they smell. What's your favorite flower? Some flowers smell good, like lilies and roses and lilacs, but not all flowers have smells that everyone would enjoy. For example, meet this flower, nicknamed Trudy. Trudy doesn't smell good at all. To be honest, it smells really, really bad. And in fact, it's been called the smelliest flower in the world. Some people say it smells like diapers. Others say it smells like rotting meat or old eggs. But even though Trudy doesn't smell so good, it still has a lot in common with other sweeter smelling flowers. For one thing, Trudy is a flower, a kind called a corpse flower. And like roses, lilies, and lilacs, a corpse flower is a kind of plant. It stays in one place, but it grows and changes just like you and I do. Plants can be small, like these lilies, or big, like a corpse flower. Trudy lives in a botanical garden in Berkeley, California, but it wasn't always this big. Like most plants, it started out as a seed in the ground. If the conditions are just right, a seed will split open and a part of the plant will push its way out. When plants do this, it's called germination, and it means a new plant is just beginning. The plant sprouts little roots that spread out and go down into the soil. Then the roots suck up water and food that the plant uses to grow. Now, lots of plants, like the corpse flower, grow flowers too, but not all plants do. If a plant happens to be a flowering kind, then it will grow a little bump called a bud. And as the plant grows, the bud slowly opens and its petals unfold. And voila, a flower has bloomed. But why does Trudy smell so smelly? Well, flowers are a really important way that plants use to reproduce or make new plants. They do that by attracting animals like birds, bees, flies, and beetles with their smell. When those animals get near a flower, they search for the source of its smell, looking for food. And while they're in there, they pick up a lot of sticky powder that's inside the flower called pollen. After the animals leave the flower, they then travel to other flowers, where they rub off the pollen that they are carrying from the first flower. When the pollen from the first flower rubs on the second flower, it can produce a new seed, which grows into a new plant. This is called pollination, and the animals that carry the pollen are called pollinators. But some pollinators don't just go for the sweet-smelling flowers like roses. They also like the stinky smell of flowers like Trudy. Insects like beetles and flies are especially fond of the corpse flower's stink. To us, it may smell like a dead animal, but to them, it smells like breakfast. And in addition to its weird smell, what's neat about corpse flowers is that they don't open up very often to let pollinators in. Some of them only bloom once every 10 years, releasing its nasty smell and then closing up again, sometimes in less than one day. That's why whenever a plant like Trudy blooms, lots of people light up to visit it, no matter how bad it smells. So even if a flower smells really bad, it's still doing its job, helping a plant make new plants, even if it is stinky. That's amazing. Thanks for watching that one with me, Squeaks. And thanks to you for joining us here at the fort today. Squeaks and I are going to go check on the garden, 
but we had a great time learning more about all the wonderful plants out there. If you wanna keep learning with Squeaks, Jesse, me, and all our friends, you can hit the subscribe button, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.